Welcome back, everyone, to the Tony Casillas Show. I'm your host, Tony Casillas, and thank you for coming back. This show will be broadcasting on December 23rd, so I'm going to ask everyone, I'm going to even ask my producer, Kevin Ebling, do you have all your Christmas shopping done? Nope. Okay, well, see, that's a guy that, look, I am going to profess this, uh, Kevin and everyone out there, that I have a tremendous wife has done all the Christmas shopping, and I am just uh, blessed to have that. Um, but she likes to shop. But uh, anyway, it's made my life easier. But the problem is, I don't know about you, I am horrible at wrapping. I mean, it is, if, let me give you this for advice. If you ever buy cheap wrapping paper and you suck at wrapping, don't do that. Invest in the wrapping paper because guess what? It will mask your indeficiencies as far as being able to wrap. Trust me, I know that. So, Kevin, it's not too late, man. I think you've got uh, 48 hours, brother. <laughs> I could get some good wrapping paper, man. But anyway, I, we got a great show today. I'm so excited about our guests. Uh, Miss Jane Slater with the NFL Network. You see her all over the place. Those are on podcasts. You, as I mentioned, you see her covers all the, the National Football League, uh, Dallas Cowboys, uh, more predominantly here in this area. But I'm so happy to have Jane on our show. Uh, first of all, let me do a little house cleaning. Uh, make sure, as I always say every week, to share our show because we want to make this organic. We want you to share it with other people and so we can grow this platform. Uh, so that's something we want to continue to get traction and continue to grow. And as always, let's hear those comments, whether it's something you don't like or something you want to disagree with. I mean, we like a little controversy, but we want you to be part of the show because that's what it's all about, man. It's not about just getting on here doing a podcast and let's go. It's all about conversing and have, getting your feedback. It's very important. Uh, so uh, make sure you share that if you're watching on Facebook Live or YouTube. Make sure you share it on all platforms. I really appreciate that. Uh, and as always, as I mentioned, Kevin Ebling, thank you as our producer, and Kim Francis, our executive producer. Uh, you may see uh, Kim when during the broadcast. She's really great at sending out messages and interacting with the audience, so shout out to her. All right, well, uh, without further ado, I'm so excited about my guest for this week's show, the one, the only, the only thing bad about her, I think, is that I think she went to the University of Texas, so a little horns down there, but I won't hold that against her. I wore my red today because there's a little banner going back, and just to pull the curtain back, she, Jane Slater with the NFL Network, who knows everything all in the National Football League, she went to Texas, so I thought, well, why don't I just bring out the Christmas red because... As I mentioned, this show will, become, will be premiering uh, December 23rd, two days before Christmas, so I could use that, but no, I just had to get that little banner. So let's bring her in. Uh, as I mentioned, Jane Slater with NFL Networks. She's been covering uh, the National Football League, has a podcast. She, uh, she's a host uh, periodically of Football uh, Morning. Uh, so you see her all over the place. Jane Slater, thanks for joining me. Finally I, got you on this show. I am so impressed with the setup in here, and I wish I'd known better. I, I was wondering if this was going to key out, because typically you're told not to wear green if there's a green wall behind you. So for those that aren't in the know, you get a green screen. You know, typically well, we got it you looks covered. like it's just your head. And Army green, else. you should be okay. But I, yeah, I, you know, I'm really, really impressed with this. And you, I mean, I remember when I was working at 105.3 The Fan, like to get a get like Tony Casillas on the show was the coolest thing ever. And you were always so <laughs> awesome. And so I always appreciated how stop that. This is not seriously, a good, uh, but I always it's... appreciated how available you made yourself. And honestly, as I was driving over here, I was like, Oh my God, I'm running five minutes late to literally a Super Bowl champion for the Cowboys that I grew up watching. and was such a fan of, and I'm late to a show. I'm like, I'm such an ass. So well, I apologize. I, really, I appreciate that because you didn't have to say that. And even, and I, didn't pay you, but I really, <laughs> and you know, the thing about it though, is that, uh, you know, Kevin, he's pretty good at this because he's, you know, he can make me softer. And with you, you look great, by the way. You're a sweetheart. Thank you. And it, it, first of all, I mean, I know that you, with all this pandemic and covering the National Football League, as you mentioned, I mean, this has got to just be crazy. The bubble or not the bubble, but we live in as far as the National Football League now. It's been a weird year. In fact, that's why I was late, Tony. I was dropping off a COVID test because every time we go on the road, we have to do a saliva test, which mm. is great that they're paying for it and making sure that all of us are safe. But I think the reason why a lot of us get into this business is the same reason I'm here doing the podcast with you in the same room is there's the 
deep dive with people more. And we are social distancing. Right, we're social distance. Yeah, yeah. But you're able to connect with people more, right? right. It, it's it's basic psychology. And so I've always enjoyed being in the locker room. And while the media scrum is over there talking to Dak, I'm talking to the backup quarterback, the third string mm -hmm. running back, who eventually all become guys or they end up somewhere else in the league. But they always have an interesting perspective and they're seeing and hearing things maybe others don't and you're getting the canned responses from the guys and as you know how this works tony the longer that you've been in the league the less vulnerable you are with the exactly. media because you've been burned and you're not giving them any nuggets and it's un it's unfortunate because you see sort of the light and the enthusiasm in their eyes about talking to a reporter right. <laughs> sort of dim yeah. because they're they get scarred and the scar tissues there but I love connecting with guys. Joe Looney mm -hmm. is one of those guys that I'm in the locker room, and he just brightens up Oh, he's day. got a lot of personality. That's uh, the guys you love to be around. Xavier Suafilo, who mm -hmm. was on the team last year, right. every time I, I walked in the locker room, he is so well-read. He loves history channels like me, so we're mm -hmm. always comparing notes. And then other guys, I mean, I absolutely adored Randall Cobb, and his wife is probably the smartest, most beautiful woman I've ever met. She is a patent attorney for biomedical companies. Wow, I can't and even... And she speaks multiple languages, say, and she's I just fascinating. Even, and he, I can't even pronounce that. Right, and, and he's just such an honorable mm -hmm. guy. When he was in the locker room, I thought he was just such a great leader. And I remember coming to him with a report, and he said to me, do me a favor, don't run with that. He goes, do you know how important chemistry is in a locker room? Mm -hmm. And if you ran with that, what that would do? And I'm like, this guy's been here for a cup of coffee. But I respected what he was saying, what that meant. And so in other words, being able just to talk things out with those guys, build those relationships, I just think it makes you a better reporter. I think it makes you more interesting to your listeners, your followers, your viewers. So this year there's been such a disconnect. And then we go to these games and it's not a big deal that we're not on the field doing pregame. I don't, that, that doesn't bother me so much. It's the fact that we're sitting in a press box and I'm watching the broadcast because we're up so high in the press box. Right that we're watching the broadcast on our laptops, iPads, and then we're doing a Zoom press conference. And I find myself going, man, I'd sure love to just be watching this from my couch and I can be just as effective. Yeah. It's a lot of work for a presentation. And I guess you take everything for granted the way you used to report. And to your point about, you know, being able to be accessible to the media. And I always like enjoyed that because I always thought that I respect the people that came to the locker room, that they criticize you. That showed up the next day because it gives you a lot of credibility. But to the point now, the way you cover it, the way you mentioned, you know, with the pandemic and everything, but uh, the social you know media, what? how does that? But you I know, mean, I was going to say, the one thing I really hate. That, it seems like they're so, it's like a double standard. They want to have this brand out there, and yet they don't want to talk to the Jane Slayers. They don't want to feel like they're being vulnerable. And yet you need both of those. See, I think as you guys get are a little bit more removed from the profession and you get on this side of the mic, I think you guys appreciate that. I always try to, I used to have a, I have a show inside the huddle at House of Blues, obviously with the pandemic, we didn't mm -hmm. have it this year. But what I loved about that show was I would bring a lot of the guys on and you spend an hour with them and you sort of talk to them and you develop this relationship. But particularly the younger guys, you sort of pull them aside because I want to see guys succeed. Um, I'm in this business because I love seeing people overcome certain things. Mm -hmm. I love people get tiny victories for themselves. Yeah. And I think I identify with a lot of the players because like them, I was a dreamer. You know, I am a dreamer. I want to do big things no differently than they do. And of course, criticism of what we do, especially as a female reporter, we get criticism all the time. So I think I'm a little bit more tuned into how that must feel for them. And of course, everyone tells you, I don't pay attention to this stuff. You do. Yeah. It does affect you. It, you're lying to yourself. And so when I would pull these younger guys aside, I would sort of tell them, open up to the media, mm -hmm. give fun anecdotes. No one really knew who Joe Looney was. And Joe came and would do our show and he's singing <laughs> Mr. Brightside. And for... He's always happy. He's got a big fa oh, a smile on his face. He literally had and, a sing-along. Yeah. Everyone was singing Mr. Brightside. And my point in bringing up the story is my mom's not, you know, super plugged into football, mm -hmm. right? And neither were some of the women in the audience. When they left, they were obsessed with Joe Looney. Yeah. They were his biggest cheerleader. Michael Gallup, another mm -hmm. example. I had a buddy just moved back from L.A., Cowboy fan, but not super plugged into football. Michael Gallup scores his first touchdown, and he literally sends me a text, and he says, the horse's name is Ed. Well, Michael Gallup at the show had talked about growing up on a farm and this horse. And so my point is, 
as huh. journalists, we make you, I think some of us get excited about making you relatable and interesting and getting people to care. And I take so much pride in being like, wow, that was the most interesting person I've talked to. I want other people to cheer for this guy as much as I am. And so that's why, that's my why. Yeah. And this year I wasn't able to do that with any of these young players. Ben DiNucci was one of those guys for me. Yeah. He did our podcast this summer and I loved his confidence. I loved, he talked about his Tony Romo tweets. There was just this swag about Ben. And so Bobby Belt and I, my uh, co-host on my show, we were cheering for Ben. We wanted him, to, but you have literally set him up to to fail. Yeah, you know, just, on the road yeah, against the right. Eagles, Sunday night no football, chance. no offensive line. And I think we all were just thought like the legend would be written. It's like, well, Tony Romo's legend wasn't written either when he got his first career mm -hmm. start. So, anyways, that's that's the thing that I think is the hardest part about COVID. Yeah. So you mentioned criticism as a female, you know, re, you know, journalists and being in broadcasting, do you think it's changed, you know, the, the Me Too movement and everything that goes along with that? I mean, how does it, when you say something like that, how does it, what are you relating to? Um, I think, and it's kind of funny, I joked with someone the other day, uh, there's just such an emphasis on our appearance. And poor Mike McCarthy, I think, got a little taste of that when he did a sit down with the local media and he wore this shirt that was compared to the guy. He from, wasn't worried about his appearance. from Modern Family. <laughs> but people were ripping him for his choice of clothes and not about anything this new head coach had to say about Dak or his offensive philosophy or what the defense was going to mm -hmm. look like. That's kind of how we feel as female reporters sometimes. But sometimes it's the criticism is deservedly so. And mm -hmm. I've been very candid about this. In Co what way, criticism? What? Um, we didn't play the game, right? Which is fair. It's a perfect but example. But Jane, there's a lot of people that are behind that microphone that didn't play the game. Fair. But I, I always try to be realistic about my skill set and whether I deserve a job or whether I've gotten a job based on being a female, right? Mm -hmm. And the best example I can give of that is a couple years ago, I had a show called Elfin Slater here mm -hmm. in Dallas oh, on yeah. 105 Through the Fan. Mark Elfin, by the way. Yeah. A Love tremendous Mark. dude, yeah. But... I would say I got that job specifically because I was a female and I was completely underqualified and it was baptism by fire. In fact, I tell some of my younger female reporters this as a cautionary tale. I was reading something from the roster and I called this guy an offensive linebacker on air. <laughs> offensive linebacker. So, of course, anyone... That may that, get a little criticism. So, of course, anyone that yeah. hears that is like, she's a pretender, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But it was such a great example of I... I felt like it was a master class in football. And now I'm like, come for me. You mm -hmm. know, like you sort of develop a sort of thicker skin. But as I'm sitting doing the radio show over the months, and I, I would go home and study like I'd never studied before. And sometimes it's you would over talk things or your takes wouldn't be authentic because you're reading it somewhere else, yeah. right? And when you don't have access to the players that I do now or the coaches, you're not getting the same sort of insight or intel that I would. So you're sort of borrowing from people mm -hmm. and it just comes off as inauthentic. And so I think unfortunately a lot of females, we sort of fake it till we make it. Um, I didn't grow up in a household with a dad that, that played football or really even cared. My brother was gay. Not that I'm saying like, mm -hmm. that's a big deal. There's plenty of the gay community loves sports, mm -hmm. but my brother could care less. And so, but I always just, I loved it. It was fun, but I needed to learn it. So I literally studied football for dummies I would do ESPN play by play, but it was, it was literally a baptism by fire. And so I think a lot of guys probably pick up on the fact there's girls like me that get jobs and, and guys that feel like they know more about the game. And there's someone like me getting a job over them. And I think it's fair. Right. And so that's why I don't, I don't completely dismiss it. Um, I'm proud of my journey and I'm proud of how far I've come, but I mean, early on it was, I was very deserving of the criticism that I got. How many gay athletes do you think you've interviewed in the National Football League? I think there's a lot more than people expect. And I, you know, I, look, it's a. I mean, I had no problem with it because yeah. I played with guys that presumably were gay and it didn't bother me. But now I think it's a little bit, it's more acceptable now. It's okay. I think this goes back to even your initial question about just being a female in sports. I think it's so much more acceptable now because younger guys are so used to seeing women in locker rooms, mm -hmm. they're so used to seeing women. I mean, I look at the Andrea Kramers of the world, the Dana Jacobsons, the, I mean, go down the list. There's, 
Rod Marinelli is another example. Rod Marinelli, who I just absolutely adore, saw me show up with a pen and paper one day instead of a just a recorder or a or an iPad, mm -hmm. and he loved that it was old school. Mm -hmm. And even this morning, Rod had texted me something, and he was like, "Be great. You've got battle scars. You continue to develop." You know, and like he'll tell me, study this or That's whatever. That's awesome. He's not a guy that gives you dirt. He's not a guy that is going to ever give you. He will never tell me what really went on behind the scenes last year. That's not who he is. Mm -hmm. He's more invested in you as a person. And the players used to tell me about that too. Like he would invest in them as, are they good fathers? Are they good men? Are they good sons? And so I love that about him. But going back to the initial uh, question, I just think there's going to be more guys in the locker room that are more progressive about it now. I remember a couple of years ago when Michael Sam yeah. uh, played for the Cowboys mm -hmm. and it was a big ta-da and there was one player that just said the most hateful thing to me about it. Um, so there's, I think there's still some of that, but as someone who had a brother who came out at 30 and growing up in Texas and parents, they're not incredibly concerned when he came out. In fact, my dad said, well, I watch modern family, like no big deal. Like it was like the greatest like response. <laughs> right. But there is sort of this. I love that show, by the it's way. It's so funny, but I think there is sort of this Who shift. Like Sophia yeah. Oh, I mean, <laughs> it's a great show. Whole, it's such a good show, but I think there's sort of this shift of let me understand you, understand yeah, the relationship. This. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I absolutely think there are. I mean, if you look just statistically, of course there is, and I've gotten a sense that there are a few. Yeah. I would never name names, but. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, it's not that big a deal. And and look, when I played, it was more macho and just people didn't talk about that. Now that they talk about that, it's it's really not that big a deal. I always say this: if you can play, you play, right? Nobody should judge you when you're, you know, your gender or if you're, uh, you know, your sexuality or anything like that. As long as the bottom line, right? It's a bottom line business, correct? Hundred yeah. percent. I'm like, well, if you cling so much to your traditional viewpoints, then why are you okay with your mm -hmm. teammate next to you cheating on his wife multiple times and you've seen it over the weekends? You yeah. know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I absolutely think it's gotten better. And then I also look at the league too. I mean, to have someone like Kate Sowers coaching wide receivers at San mm -hmm. Francisco, did we ever think that was going to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I think things are changing and I think that's good. Yeah, I think that you're... Yeah, I talked to you about this before. Is it the connection with the player? Because I think it's... You want to then to be comfortable, but then you have to do your job. And I know that you may have come under fire. Uh, was it about a month ago or <laughs> whenever the report was? Is that the Cowboys players didn't believe in the coaching staff, and you felt like that that's something you need to report because it was a reliable source. And yet people criticize you for re reporting that, which I think for me, if I'm going to tell you something, I'm not. It's I'm, it's on the record. And I just thought that was kind of fair. I thought it was tremendous that you were able to report that. That's my point. My whole point in reporting that was it goes back to the relationships and knowing some of the guys in that locker room and just feeling like it's unfortunate to me that we're talking about what trash these players are, that they're historically bad. There was a decline in the defense last year, but historically bad. And you would hear guys in press conferences making comments about the playbook or attitude or effort that you're not expecting from a bought in, energized, excited, invigorated team. It's certainly not statements we've heard from the Cleveland Browns organization and first year head coach Kevin Stefanski or guys in Washington talking about Ron Rivera. I mean, go down the list. So I just thought it was really curious because under Jason Garrett, never heard that. Uh, I was here during the Bill Parcells years. I sure as hell didn't hear it back then. <laughs> I was going to say, if you were going to hear something, you would have heard it back then because it was either Bill Parcells my way or it was a highway approach. Right. And so I just, for me, the spirit of the report was no one's even talking about the coaching staff, mm -hmm. but yet we're just trashing the players. But maybe there's an extra piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was important to get out. Now I cushioned it and said, and, and I fully believe it's not just cushioning it saying, let us also consider the fact that yes, there are players that maybe are not as talented as they think they are. Or maybe you've got guys who aren't investing in the brother next to them or finding ways to overcome the fact that maybe they can't do team dinners or, I mean, I've heard the chemistry is very off mm -hmm. this year in that locker room and we're seeing it. Yeah. Uh, 
But if but the report what? did anything, yeah. it sort of caused people to start talking in that organization. You well, know? the problem uh, that the way I look at it is that you go out and make changes because players didn't like, you mentioned Rod Marinelli to me, I think is a tremendous coach. He's, he's an old school guy, you know, does things he, the way he, he feels like that that's the way his philosophy is. And you had Chris Richard, the guy that was supposed to have been the, the co defensive coordinator. Isn't it amazing how much we talk about the Dallas Cowboys? I mean, I know that that's part, but that's, that's the polarization of them. But to the point about that, it's, uh, you know, you wanted to change and you got it. And then you're complaining because the philosophy that you wanted maybe differently. Because I remember hearing things last year, it was too predictable and everything. And now it's not, it, you know, it's going to be more like complex and, you know, help us but play. Tony, so I it seems like it's like a double standard in a way, if that makes sense. But I never heard these guys, even when things were, I, I mean, things were never this mm -hmm. bad with Jason Garrett. I mean, I, ne I never heard, God, the only guy that ever said anything was Des Bryant in our sit down interview after he got cut and he called him the Garrett guys. And he was frustrated that there was a leadership council meeting and the guys were asked whether he was a cancer or not. And guys he considered his friends literally said, cut him. And even then I never name checked those guys because right. I didn't want to create dissent and it just wasn't worth it. Mm -hmm. Des ended up of course, name checking them on Twitter mm -hmm. like seven months later. But I just, this coaching staff to me has been interesting. And like, I agree there's a lot of things that are so unique to, mm -hmm. to Mike McCarthy and the poor yeah. guy was away for a year. He is excited authentically about coming back and coaching. The job he gets is the Dallas Cowboys. And as you know, I, I can never ex describe to people what it's like to be around the aura of Jerry Jones. Yeah. I mean, he is magnetic. There is, and there is a, they call it the glamour beat. It's kind of the joke at our network. Like Jane's on the glamour beat. It is all, the, I mean, even the press box food is, I mean, second to none. There's when I go somewhere like else and I'm like, this that, is a hot dog. And I'm like, yeah. you don't have the Jerry Mac and cheese. Oh my it, gosh. It, That's this, the bomb, by the it's way. It's amazing. Best micro, macaroni cheese you'll ever have. Ever. But there's just something that comes with all of it. But I just don't know if, even without some of these things, I mean, yeah. even if you go back to the start of the season, when they had Dak, when they had the offensive line, just seemed a little off. Yeah, this didn't the the chemistry and the continuity just seems like yeah, it was it wasn't. And there. there's challenges. Look, mm -hmm. and to, to your point when we were talking about earlier, you I think you need the physical connect. I think you need to to invest, but you can invest by picking up the phone, FaceTiming your guys, asking for some more one on ones, like all of those things. I think maybe a more Again, this is not a knock because I'm 40 now, and so I'm beginning to feel oh, what God, it's like. To, so there's an expiration for Dayton, so Dallas for women, Jane. so I hate to bring up the age. But and look, a day over 25. God bless you. Checks in the mail. <laughs> but I do believe that you sort of need the the youthful energy, the enthusiasm, the 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 excitement that comes with the job that maybe Mike. Yeah, and if I was supposed, if I was to judge Mike, nothing that I'm not trying to judge him. But a guy that's been out of football for a year and has to do this creative way of communicating, which we use <laughs> now Zoom and our FaceTime, doesn't really seem like a guy coming out of hibernation after one year would want to have to do that because the COVID-19 has changed the landscape of how we do business, especially communicating to players. As a player, I'm thinking, I don't even know if I could would be able to uh, you know, prosper in that environment because it's just so different. And I, you know, it's funny, there was a, uh, when I was at Longhorn Network in Austin, there was this guy who did this fascinating thing with a lot of players where he would consult for coaches and let you know if a player is better in the classroom or outside. In other words, when you walk him through certain skill sets or a scheme or a play, is he better if you put it on the whiteboard mm -hmm. or do you physically take him outside and walk? And so then when I, I look at younger players and just attention spans i've got to think a lot of them are just better oh when absolutely your physical touch better to be in a classroom than doing a zoom class like my kids are doing now they've been doing you know online college and the, i mean you just don't ascertain the information as well much. they've talked about grades are dropping yeah. in schools it's just it's hard yeah uh i mean even god this will get me in trouble but even when we do like our big like summits at the nfl network i'm guilty of turning off the camera and i'm like organizing my closet while i'm listening to everything right so um <laughs> 
so I, I think that's been a challenge for all mm -hmm. them. And so that's why I think the outside investment is so big that these guys have to connect. And when I talk to these other teams, and again, this is why I'm saying it's not a myopic viewpoint. When I talk to some of these other teams, that's what's happening is mm -hmm. there's, there's a connectivity that's not forced. It's, you know, I keep bringing up Kevin Stefanski because I'm just so fascinated with the way he's been able to turn that program around and the way the guys just like, I mean, they can't stop talking about it. And, and I keep Brown's think, head coach. Right. Yeah. And I keep thinking like, Jerry, why didn't you give mm -hmm. Kevin Stefanski the call? Mm -hmm. like, why, why wouldn't you? Um, why was it a Marvin Lewis and a Mike McCarthy? Like, why was that it? Urban Meyer was on the radar, maybe Lincoln Riley, but we didn't hear about going and trying to like roll the dice on some of these guys. And in the past, look at all the coaches that have left that have gone on to do big things. I mean, I look at Mike Zimmer, John Payton, like you know, go down the list. Mike Zimmer, but uh, tremendous guys he, he, he could have had. Is Jerry Jones a problem? Is he getting in his own way? I mean, you can't really – because he is the brand. I mean, he developed this huge – you know, it's uh, the most valuable franch sports franchise in the world. I mean, has he gotten in his own way of success? What I love about Jerry is how – Obviously, he's been successful, but as yeah. far as winning. What I love about Jerry is how authentically invested he is in the team. And when people say he doesn't know football – you haven't spent a lot of time talking to, uh, to him. And he's so with it. And again, I'm bringing up age again. It's, I think he's 79, 79 this year. His ability to go down. I mean, when you talk to opposing coaches, right, they'll be like, oh, 78 or 40. Like, they, they're not rattling off names. Jerry knows their names. Mm -hmm. He knows their positions. Like, he lives and breathes football. I mean, his office looks out to the field. He's physically there. Um, he's ever present at camps. He does the radio interviews once a week. You know, I, I'm the type of person that would feed off that energy. Like if that guy at 79 is putting that much work into whatever he's doing, I want a piece of that. And I think you see that with some guys like Jalen Smith, for instance, like I think he like thinks Jerry hangs the moon as he should. I mean, Jerry, Jerry everything, paid him a lot of money, but every, in well, and everything Jerry touches, it's like the Midas touch. It's like when you go out to the star in Frisco, I'm a big fan of Coca-Cola you will not find Coca-Cola at one restaurant at the no Star in way. Frisco. At any restaurant, you can go to Mi Cucina, Mi Cucina Freshy, uh, Cane Rosso, which is fabulous. Get you some sponsorships, Tony. You sure in the hell won't find a Dos Equis there either. It's all like, yeah, but it's, <laughs> really? it's like the whole Pepsi brand, right? Right. That is the beauty of Jerry. I had a buddy. This is a funny story. I had a buddy that met Jerry in New York. He was an investment guy, and you know Jerry was doing the – whole what is it Comstock I can't remember it was like some energy company and he was just enthralled with the way that Jerry brings you in I walked into Combine this year and I was with three NFL uh, mm -hmm. head coaches guys that are literally I won't say their names because I don't want to make them look like you know they were fanboying but these were guys who were in the playoffs yeah. so then you can like kind of go down the list right they were like introduce me to Jerry Jones and I'm like what and they're like like fanboys like introduce me to Jerry yeah. Jones so I walk him over to meet Jerry, <laughs> and Jerry does the classic thing that just drives you in. He sort of like locks eyes with you, yeah. and he's like, when I played at Arkansas, he's like, me and my men. It's we, hypnotic. We it's fought like, together. Yeah. And you like, you, I've heard the story actually like four or five times. It is, <laughs> what is it, the, the farm's uh, luncheon that he does every year at uh -huh. AT&T Stadium? Okay. So even though I'm very familiar with the story, I've heard it a million times, I'm back in because yeah. the, the it's... The passion's real. It's authentic. And even as a reporter, I probably shouldn't feel this way as mm -hmm. an organization that you you cover. But the first time I met Jerry was when I was working one, 105 Fan and Elf introduces me and he, he pulls down his sunglasses and he goes, well, aren't you a pretty little thing? <laughs> and we kind of had this banter on air for a little bit. And I just thought he was like hilarious. And then I'm at training camp about three years ago and I just filled in anchoring on uh, one of the shows at the network, and he stopped me. He goes, Giant, I got to tell you, I looked up at my TV the other day, and I saw you up there. <laughs> and I thought to myself, she's one of ours. <laughs> and I don't know why, like I said, as, an, as a reporter, you're supposed to be objective, but, and I am. But growing up in Dallas, every kid wore a Dallas Cowboys starter jacket growing up. My grandmother was probably the only one in the family that really loved sports, and she just always bashed Jerry. I mean, Jerry Jones made her, like, more mad than any president. I mean, just 
everything was Jerry Jones's fault. I mean, we could talk climate change and it was Jerry yeah. Jones's fault. To get that sort of like the fact that he knew who I was or that he considered me one of theirs, that meant something. That's something I'm carried with. And so maybe that's why like I was like, man, when I took the hits about a month ago, that that hurt. Uh, He's very charismatic and very persuasive. I remember the first time I came to Dallas and – and look, he just makes you feel like you've heard it before. You're the only person in the room. And he's very charismatic and has that personality. And that's just the way he is with people. And that's what people gravitate to that. And the fact that he's such a huge success with his wealth and what he's developed. I mean, that people like to be around that, especially players. But I think sometimes, and I know this by experience with him. I told you the story about they, they will find a way that they, when you're not looking, they'll find a way not to pay you. And that's the thing about it. I think sometimes guys get a little too comfortable with that because at the end of the day, you have to go out and perform. That's what your job is to do. But then I think it's almost like the Uncle Jerry Jerry syndrome, if that makes sense. Like, okay, but you better watch it. Don't turn your back because Uncle Jerry will cut you. Well, we saw that with Zeke a little bit. Remember, it was I've earned the right because he would sort of bailed Zeke out of a couple of things and, you know, to Jerry's credit, I mean, those were some serious allegations against Zeke in his rookie season. And Jerry came out and said things that no owner would say. But I, I believe he authentically believed it. And if you read a lot of the, the police report without going into too, too much, Jerry obviously had a lot of information mm-hmm. and felt comfortable with his take. But so then when he decides to hold out, and it's two years ahead of when Jerry should have to pay him. Business. Jerry saw that as a slight, though, because to your point, you're one of ours. Yeah you know, what are you doing here? And then mm-hmm. when Dak decided, I'm going to bet on myself, mm-hmm. I think that that also drove him nuts because he's yeah. like, you were fourth on the depth mm-hmm. chart, four-string quarterback. I literally didn't even let Tony Romo compete for this job when he mm-hmm. came back. It, I gave it to you. That Oiko's endorsement is because of me. Yeah. That Campbell's Soup endorsement is because of me. And so, yeah, I mean, I think there's some element of that. And I think they sort of sell players on – no different than what I do. Like you cover the Dallas Cowboys, Jane. That's why. Yeah. That's why people know who you are. Yeah. I, it's, it's you know they care. I mean, there's a reason why that, regardless of they only won three games, there's always something going on. People watch the star, and that's. I think that's Jerry. I think that he's has a lot of pride in that. Um, let's shift gears real quick. You start. You went to the University of Texas. You're from Rockwall, right? In Dallas, or grew up in Walk, Rockwall, and then. Obviously went to the U- University of Texas, and oh, by the way, I'm, I don't. You heard the news about Fred Akers passing away. Uh, it's very sad. I mean, I, 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 he recruited me back in the day. Oh wow! And, yeah. So, uh, anyways, I didn't know. If, I'm, I'm sure you knew that, but Fred Akers passed away. But um, so sad. Yeah. But anyway, you went to UT, um, and then uh, so tell us about all that. Well, it's so weird because Kyle Shanahan was a good friend, and it was we were at Combine about four years ago, and it was. Uh, it was like the Paul Rudd moment. It was like, look at us. Look at us. Who would have thought? You know, we're both doing this thing, you know? Um, Chris Sims was there, another good friend. Yeah. Um, who else is there that I feel like has kind of been doing, you know, big things? Uh, it's it, it, it was a really fun group. As a matter of fact, I went off to college because I wanted to be a political international correspondent, obsessed. I mean, in my household, there wasn't ESPN. I don't think ESPN was ever Which on. Which network would you be on right now? You don't have to say that. Should I? Um, <laughs> don't uh, you hate politics, man? You're talking about judgmental. Well, man. I double majored in politics. I mean, I... I never tell anyone who you support. I thought I was going to be a press secretary. I thought I was going to either cover the president in the Rose Garden or I was going to work overseas as an international cor- correspondent. Christian Amanpour, Lara Logan, <laughs> she was fabulous. <laughs> you know, she was this former South African radio reporter who was embedded with the Taliban. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this blonde is yeah. you know it's just like a it makes you feel like because i think as some blondes you get told you know just be pretty you're not supposed to be smart and have anything to do with like foreign affairs and international <laughs> politics i mean she got some of the biggest interviews so when i went off to you know college i mean at that time 24-hour news was really coming in mm-hmm. as a matter of fact my speech and debate class freshman year was the oj simpson chase oh lord and the trial and then my senior year was the Clinton impeachment hearings. And so we, you know, we watched all of it. And my dad, 
like I said, ESPN was never on my, I literally cannot remember ESPN ever being on. My dad was just, I dragged him to a baseball fan a game once to meet Mark Mulder. And that's mm-hmm. another fun story, but it was always on. And we had a bird that we named Scud because he made the sound of the Scud missiles when there wow. was the Gulf War coverage. I mean, that's just, that's even to this day, my dad constantly has Fox News on in his car. And he always says, you're such a disappointment. <laughs> You could have been on Fox News. I mean, he literally does not care. I will tell him like, hey, dad, I'm covering this game or I had this interview. And he's like, yeah, what time is that on? What network? And I'm like, I've been working at the NFL Network for five years. I mean, it does not matter to him. Yeah. Um, but I was obsessed with politics. And it mostly is because I went to Rockwell my freshman year and then I went to Rollette, which was a brand new 5A school in Garland and mm-hmm. Garland's huge. But we didn't have a robust football team mm-hmm. like JV was playing varsity, you name it. But when I went off to Texas, I mean, there was just this history and, you know, the baseball team was, you know, making a run at the national championship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was the major Apple white years. And it was just, it was exciting. And there was this guy, Bill Little, who used to write these amazing pieces about the players. It sort of took you inside. I mean, you felt filled to dreams. Mm -hmm. And I just found myself going, I love politics, but man, this seems like a really cool gig. Yeah. But you sort of are intimidating as intimidated if you didn't grow up around sports, you didn't play sports. Like, what's my entry point? Like, how? Like, I don't know anything about this. Like, mm-hmm. how do I get into it? So, I sort of fell into it eventually. But I did do news for eight years, and sometimes I think about going back. I mean, I'm I'm a news junkie. I love political news. Obviously, it's gotten. I think the problem is the networks have gotten so polarized. There's, it's like they've leaned into what the fan base is. Yeah, and and that's how you should think. And there's no longer, they're no longer centric. They're no longer objective. I mean, seeing Matthew McConaughey get blown up the other day is like, <laughs> you know, I'd love for people to be more centric. He's not saying he's either party. He's saying, why don't we become radically centric? Like, why don't we all like maybe meet somewhere in the middle? So, yeah, I mean, that's been a little bit frustrating, but that's kind of how I, I went off to college. I mean, I don't know if you remember uh, George Magazine, JFK mm-hmm. Jr. Oh, yeah, J- J- JFK Magazine. I as a matter of fact, I dated this guy very briefly, but I had said to him that I was obsessed with that magazine. Right. And when my grandmother passed away, I was thinking like, oh, she had all of them. Because I'd come to my grandparents' house and my grandfather was the type of guy that read every magazine, would leave stick it notes, and you'd sit down at the dinner table and he'd want to discuss. So it was almost sort of like reading comprehension all the time. But I was obsessed with these George magazines and she threw them out, which was so frustrating. And he went and collected a lot of these for me and gave them to me as a gift, the kindest, most thoughtful gift I've ever gotten. But I would devour this because it was this intersection of politics and entertainment. And there were these thought provoking articles. That was what I wanted to do. So when I went off to school, that was it. And then you talk about a massive pivot. I mean, I couldn't have like pivoted further away. Into right. what so, I'm you, doing now. so you obviously were educated more in, to po- in politics and you made the decision to go into sports. Yeah. How did you prepare yourself? You mentioned that you, you know, you had to obviously do a lot of research, but to feel comfortable in your own skin as far as talking about it. You mentioned when you had a, a radio show where you, you know, you called the, the you know, the position the wrong name. But to that point, what gave you the confidence to move forward and pick that field, sports and journalism? I just think knowledge is important. I mean, as a journalist, when you can't have an opinion, you're supposed to tell you what other people are saying. Mm -hmm. And so the more people that you know, I'm constantly on my phone, like from 8 a.m. to whatever. And I have so many coaches, agents, uh, performance center coaches, you name it, that I talk to to sort of get thoughts on, Mm -hmm. but I'm always picking people's brains Mm -hmm. always because I think it allows you some nuances when you talk about the sport and it just makes you more knowledgeable. I mean, you don't know what you don't know. And so I think I started getting more confident over the years as I developed those relationships and I was able to report things that were told to me Mm -hmm. or that I ran by people. And so like, once you have that confidence, I don't necessarily talk all the X's and O's of a game. I talk about the storylines surrounding it how people are feeling, how they're responding, mm-hmm. what's the history of it, how they're preparing, how they felt in this moment, how this team got them motivated, um, what motivates this player. That's where my confidence comes from. And I think young journalists early on, especially females, they're so top heavy with like stats and like, like I said, it's just sort of like, just yeah, fake I it think, till you make it. And you, yeah. can, you can see through it really easily, right? Yeah. But when your confidence comes from, well, I've talked to all these people, 
and I've bounced all these ideas off them and I've done my, my homework and I've asked questions, mm -hmm. it allows you to have answers. You know, it's the thing of when you watch a broadcaster and by any means am I trying to crit criticize anyone, but I feel like some former athletes try to fill too much, you know, fill too much airtime with what the what they're trying to say, and it almost gets to be too much. Instead of just, no one wants to hear the X. I mean, we want to hear the X's and O's. We want to hear your personality. And you know what? I mean, that guy got his head knocked off or got the crap knocked out of him. And you know, it seems to me that there's so much. Uh, they're always trying to fill the air too much with words. I find when a broadcaster is a little bit more overbloviated, they're making up for the fact they didn't watch the game or prep for the game. Oh, that's a good point. I'm kind not, of see through that's pretty transparent then, right? I'm actually reading this really great book right now. Um, it's called The Laws of Human Nature, and it sort of talks to that. Like people that overtalk are making up for some of their deficiencies or insecurities. And when you start paying attention to that, I, I, I think about myself sometimes. I'm like, oh, when I overtalk in that situation, it's I'm a little insecure. Or I feel like I've got to make them think I know what I'm talking about, right? So you sort of like start paying attention to the cues, but... I think one of the best in the business right now, well, there's two. Emmanuel Ocho and I used to work together mm -hmm. at Longhorn like Network. Yeah, he's a great dude. And Ocho used to drive me crazazy. I remember, and he I. Does he, uh, the interview with the black man? Is that yeah, the. Yeah, Uncomfortable Conversations yeah. with the Black Man. Yeah. And I remember he was just starting out and he's really I smart. I need to do one about uncomfortable talks with the brown man. What you, do you think about that? I think you should. I mean, I think we're all trying to understand each other this year, right? Um, but I remember he was yeah. he was new to the business and, you know, I'd been doing it, what, 13 years at that mm -hmm. point. And so I remember. I remember him coming to me and talking to me about like how he should move up. And, you know, my advice came from my experience. I'm like, well, I went to Tyler, Texas, and then I went to Denver and I worked as a producer and what you just got to pay your dues. Right. This guy's got like a master's degree, plays the piano. Like there's nothing this guy can't do. Right. Right. And he used to drive me nuts because he'd always have these like stockpiled photos of himself. And like he'd post something. I'm like, oh, were you like in Can He's like, nah, girl, you got to keep them in the bank. And I'm like, this guy's just ridiculous. Right. <laughs> but slowly but surely, what I loved about him was the work that he would put mm -hmm. in. I'm not going to name some of the other guys I've worked with, but they would come on air. They'd never watch tape. They never uh, had prepared for the game. And then they're just saying this crazy stuff on the air, and you're like, that doesn't make any sense. Acho watches the game. Right. He tries to get you to care about the game. And then he'll he'll make analogies. They're like, ah, I didn't really see it that way. Mm -hmm. Like he'll like use a dating analogy, which he claims he came up with first. I argue that I started it last year with Jason Garrett, long story. But I sent him a text recently and I said, I am so sorry that I gave you the worst advice of your career. And I go, I hope you used it as fuel because people have told me in the past, like you're gonna have to do this, this and this. And then you don't. But I go, I am so glad you ignored that because you have just blown up this year and you are just that good. Mm -hmm. The other one that I think is just naturally good at what he does is Nate Burleson. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Yeah, got a lot of personality. It's the way that he, what makes a good broadcaster and the reason why they want athletes on their show is they want you to take us mm -hmm. behind the door, mm -hmm. like share anecdotal stories with me. One of my favorite stories was Michael Irvin. And you probably know all about this, Tony. He said you wanted to Which win. Story? He said, well, exactly. <laughs> he said you wanted to win because you were hungry. So you eat like what, four or five hours before the game, and then you go up there, warm up, mm -hmm. play the game. Meal. Yeah. You get on the plane. And if you didn't win, Jimmy didn't let you eat. And so like you wouldn't get your sandwich or you wouldn't get whatever. And so everyone wanted to win because uh, I think you didn't he's eat. I think he's embellishing a little Did bit. Did he about, embellish? Yeah, that, that sounds... He's such a good storyteller, old uh, Michael. I'll, I'll go with that. Such I'll go a good with that. storyteller. I think that that's uh, that's that's valid. But it's just stuff like that that you know, like look. But it's I just, an example. That's what you. you know. But I'm eating it up. I'm like, yeah. God, that is such a great story. Well, just yeah, and that's a, that's kind of the end of the things examples you use because you know if you don't play, you don't get to eat. I mean, it's like my kids. I'm like, hey, you don't, you know, you don't do your chores growing up. You don't get to eat. Well, I know that it didn't even work. But, uh, but it's yeah, like I, Tony Romo when he's on there. Yeah. Tony does such a good job of Tony sort of, Romo, is he a better broadcaster than he was a quarterback? Okay, that's another one where I had to eat my crow. So I mean he's getting paid fourteen million a year. I apologize. So he must be pretty 
I mean, he got overpaid. I mean, it's nothing wrong about getting overpaid. Well, anyway. I think he, he obviously having Jim Nance vouch for you is huge. And I think to get your first job with Jim, Jim Nance in a boot, it's all, it's all about being set up to succeed. Right. And Jim wanted him to succeed, which I think is great. Like you want somebody that's, when I did the show with Elf, he's like, you run all block. And I always thought that was really cool mm -hmm. of him. That's what Jim does. They got such great chemistry. They've got a great, cause yeah. they're friends. It's mm -hmm. natural. And you will find when you do TV, you're going to know when two people don't get along. I mean, sometimes you'll do a show and you're like, I, I tell RJ Choppy this all the time, 105 through the fan, you were the worst person I've ever done a show with because you were so unprepared. Like the yuck monkey thing that you do does not work for me. And I mean, I say it to him, like we're best friends, like it's not a big deal, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, there's just some people, the chemistry does not mm -hmm. work. It's very authentic with them, but I had gone on Dan Patrick and it was during that, is he going to go to the Broncos? Uh, is he going to Houston? I mean, man, wouldn't Houston have loved him a couple years yeah. ago, right? Yeah. Is he going to go to Houston or is he going to go in the booth? And I remember going on Dan Patrick. I always remember when I'm wrong. And so I went on Dan Patrick and I of said, of course, I I'm said, not even going to say that. And I'm right. not a comment, but I said, I mentioned that to my wife all the time. It's like, how'd those words taste? Yeah. I was wrong. It's like, I didn't, I didn't say that. But anyway, I but, didn't mean <laughs> Well, but I was on Dan Patrick and I was like, because you know, over the years, you know, guys had talked about Tony, like one had told me that he would like Google himself in between practice. And he was just like this guy that was always just like, I always loved his confidence. That was the thing about Tony. It was like, there was like this inherent confidence. Um, but I said, look, I just think, you know, you've got to be, it takes work. I mean, mm -hmm. look at Troy Aitman. He didn't even start in the booth. And, you know, I just, I think it's going to take a little bit of time for him. I mean, he was like star of the year. Yeah. And then t t just in his second year to get the contract mm -hmm. that he did. So I saw him at Super Bowl and I said, by the way, I messed that one up. <laughs> I am so sorry. He probably did not even care, nor did he hear the comments. It was just important for me to acknowledge I was an idiot. But you can see the personality come that's from behind the curtain. Like Troy, you know, he was almost like a stoic guy that he was a stoic leader in a good way because that's just the way he – you know, his personality wasn't how he, you know, he he kind of gelled with the team and, and people appreciate that. But, you know, he's got this different perspective when he's doing broadcasting. But Tony, man, to me, it just seems effortless. Like, it's just you and I sitting here doing a podcast, just having a good time. We're talking about, you know, watching the game. And I, th I think that the people really admire that. And they're predicting the plays. I mean, now you got guys out there trying to do that. And there's only one that uh, can be the, the person that pioneers that. I just think it's interesting. Well, and you also, I think for Cowboy fans, Cowboy fans just are going to always wonder what if. You know, what if on that 13-3 mm -hmm. season they had had Tony? I would argue that just being in the locker room that year, the chemistry was so palpable with Dak. It was just mm -hmm. different. And as guys get older and they have families, and, you know, Tony was always kind of this – I remember meeting Tony when he was third string Tony. No one knew who he was. And he lived with all these guys from Eastern Illinois. And they lived like in a frat house over mm -hmm. in Preston Hollow. And he was just like the most gullible, like naive, you know, like cool dude. Like any guy you'd meet in Uptown. And then you saw the star, the sort of star evolve. And he's dating Carrie Underwood and Jessica Simpson. And, you know, it happens in Dallas. Um, but then you get married and you have kids and you, you're not – hanging out with the boys mm -hmm. Dak can do that and Dak does do that and but we just saw it with such a young group and it was such a talented draft class it was it was like catching fire it was the hot hand theory so while I still thought that they should have made them compete the following year um it was interesting to watch that year but yeah I mean I think Tony is and I actually did a Verizon um sit down with him at Super Bowl and even I found myself while we were sitting there <laughs> I've never had to literally just bump set and the guy was literally spiking it every time. I mean, the stories that he told, his knowledge of football, even covering him all those years, just when you just get Tony talking, he's just authentically good at mm -hmm. it. Yeah, I think that that's the thing also that people see and I think that's the sincerity of it and everything else. And um, That's Peyton Manning too. Yeah, I mean, I mean Peyton guy, Manning, get he, in a booth. Yeah. It, he is – so good. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but when there was no sports and they had the, uh, I love golf when they had the golf tournament, uh, with, it was Peyton tiger, Phil the challenge, the challenge. Peyton is just, it's just natural. Like some people just have it. Did you watch the last challenge with, uh, with Charles Barkley and Phil I, Mickelson? I didn't, but I love uh, it. was so, it was Charles great. It was Barkley. great. And the fact that he didn't have, 
So Phil was kind of this Zen master with him. He told him every time he got up there to hit the ball, he says, okay, quiet your mind down, take a deep breath. And Charles didn't have that unorthodox hitch in his swing and everything that we laugh at on YouTube. And he just had, a, had this better swing. I mean, it's a really a good swing. I'm like, dang, Phil, I mean, you do that. You can do that for Charles. You can do that for anyone. But I thought it was pretty cool. But you're right about Peyton Manning, man. I mean, his personality, dude, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. I'm uh, always too fascinated with – how much other athletes are obsessed with golfers. So I have a good friend, Colt Nost, who used to live here in mm -hmm. Dallas, and now he's doing some, he's great now doing his podcast, and he's been doing some stuff with CBS Sports, but he's this short, rotund guy who is better looking than John Daly, but the guy that just doesn't look physically like a golfer, right? And he's friends with all these celebrities and I'm always like fascinated. Like, so Charles Barkley was in town one weekend and I, I meet Chuck and I'm like, what is this guy doing hanging out with Colt? Everyone is obsessed with golfers because every elite athlete struggles with golf. Yeah. That's why it's so easy to get them to go to a pro-am. I was pitching to my network. I said, we're starting this NFL plus thing. I hope I didn't like give that thing away too early. But, no, it's okay. We'll, we'll tease it. I but mean, I good. said, uh, but I said, why do we not do in the off season, celebrity pro-am live events with all of our athletes. I mean, we see it in Tahoe when mm -hmm. all those guys do it. I'm like, what a better way to develop relationships with these guys. But also see, I felt better about myself as a golfer after watching Tom Brady win six Super Bowl rings and make the worst shots. And to know that it's kind of like, you know, the Us Weekly stars are just like us. Just like us, he struggles as bad on the golf course. Yeah, Mentally I, I and... Skill wise, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm the same way. I love golf, and I think it's just amazing how effortless it is for them to play the game. And vice versa, when they get into, you know, your world, it's just, and, and you know, golf is great. If you're going to spend four and a half hours on the golf course, you got to have a few beers, you got know, boom box, got to have the boom box, and have fun, do a little gambling, you know, and just enjoy it because that's a lot of time to spend together. Um, so when you look at your career from five years from now. Where do you want, where do you see that? You know, what's so weird about that question, Tony, is ever since I graduated high school, I had like a five-year, 10-year, 15-year mm -hmm. plan. I don't know if it's turning 40 and my contract's up in August. I've sort of had this mini midlife crisis. And so I've been asking that question a lot. I don't know. Um, sometimes I find myself going, I really miss telling stories. Like I did the Helmets for Helmets story mm -hmm. and I did this yoga story. I love telling stories about people and players. I love the Sunday stuff. I love the breaking news stuff. But you really have to have a stomach and an appetite for it. You know, Adam Schefter is one of my favorite guys in the business. Not only is he so great about building up the next generation, specifically women. His daughter, Dylan, is the cutest thing ever. I think she's 12, 13 now. But she's been interviewing players since Pro Bowl. And I, I don't know if he's got a heart for women doing this because of that. But mm -hmm. like my best friend, Diana Rossini at ESPN, he has been so great to her. Guys like that that are doing that year in and year out, it takes a lot. It takes a stomach to constantly be texting players, front office execs, GMs, because you just feel like you're always transactional and you're always like going like, feed me, feed you me, feed me. You say your old mind is always, and if always that's not, busy. Yeah, and if that's yeah. not who you are authentically yeah. as a person, sometimes – you question it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just sort of in this weird place. Do I want to go news? Do I want to continue doing this? You know, what does the next chapter look like? Because I do feel like I had always had big dreams to go the network and, you know, I feel like I've done it, you know, like covering the Cowboys and having a podcast with Colin Coward and, and even doing radio here in Dallas. I never thought that I'd be able to do all of those things but I feel like I've climbed to the top of the mountain. I've looked around and I'm like, I'm either just going to stay here or I'm going to go down and climb another 14er. So yeah, I think I'm kind of doing a little soul searching these days going, what's next? I, I don't know what that is. <laughs>